So we learned last time that um, just because we're justified before God and free from the penalty of sin, that salvation ultimately means being freed from the corruption of sin, from the rot of sin in our daily lives, so that it leads to practical uh, holiness and righteousness. And uh, that we don't have the power in ourselves to do this, not in our flesh. Um, we need to be joined to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God needs to be joined with our spirit. And it's very uh, mysterious. I mean, there's no other way to put it when we talk about these things because we're talking about our core identity, our very being, our very existence. And we're talking about me, so to speak, the I uh, who exists. So let me just be clear about that. If I say I've smashed my foot, when I speak of my foot, I speak about it as if it's a, it's a part of it's something I possess, my foot, as if it's like my pencil. Uh, but is, isn't my foot me? Well, kind of. I mean, you wouldn't say your foot is that, like, your foot is you. The, the you, uh, who, so to speak, on the inside, has a foot. Uh, we can even speak of our minds. <clears throat> my mind is confused. Um, and so we talk about it as if it's just something I possess. And the I who possesses it, well, where is that? Well, it's not my brain. It's not exactly my mind. The I, the me, who uh, is kind of a mystery. I'm not. I'm located in a body, but I'm not. Um, it's not just a part of my body, or even just saying the whole of my body is me. <clears throat> the I is a spiritual reality. That's the point. <clears throat> so. For God to, for us to be in the Spirit and for the Spirit of Christ to be in us is not speaking about, uh, about our corpus, about our body. It's speaking about the I who exists, who is an immaterial reality and yet is joined to a material body. Uh, and so we have invited God in to our very being and he has joined himself to us and yet we're still ourselves we we don't cease to be who we are uh, but we become a new creation but we are still ourselves um, and we could never accomplish holiness and righteousness apart from God so if we if we look look now at the rest of the chapter and we look at what is the spirit then going to do to help us uh, what we notice is that it's not there's not a set of say five things or like it's some kind of a formula you know these are the three or four things the spirit's going to do and then everything will be okay uh, it's not like a self-help book the rest of chapter eight uh, it's more profound than that uh, we already noticed that um, in verses 12 and 13 that by the spirit one of the main things the spirit of course is going to help us with is to mortify or put to death the deeds of the body so that we might begin to enter into the fullness of the reality of eternal life now that we might enter into the full blessing or the fuller blessing of eternal life um, and which ultimately means a holy life but then he tells us also that the spirit of god will um, bear witness with our spirit uh, that we are children of god uh, what's all this about? Well, it's going to take up most of the rest of the chapter, actually, is this idea of the Spirit um, spiritually attesting to our spirit. So it's something, it's not just an intellectual or a logical thing. It's not just an emotional thing. It's a spiritual sense of identity that the Holy Spirit gives to our spirit that we, in fact, are children of God. We belong to God. It says here, we are um, sons of God. We have been adopted. We cry out to God, Abba, Father, the way a child would call out to his, his father. And we discover that since we are sons of God, this spirit we have is not a spirit of slavery. We're not, we're not living in constant fear. We have a sense of confidence and peace that we are joined to God and we are his sons. And... Um, and as sons, that makes us heirs. 
Well, what does that mean to be an heir of God or to be a joint heir with of Christ? Well, it goes way back to the story of Genesis that when God first made the world, he, he put humanity in charge of it so that we would have dominion over it. We would rule creation. And of course, we failed in our duties and now God has saved us and restored us. And so he's restored us to our original purpose. Through Christ, we're going to be ruling the creation, governing the world. And of course, we will be joining him in his governance, but we will also be governing or co-governing. That's what it means to be joint heirs. That, um, But it doesn't feel that way right now. We, we feel like we're in a world where we suffer loss. The world hates us. Uh, the devil seems to be primarily in control or at least in control of a lot. And uh, all the suffering that we experience and that we witness, it just seems like um, the world has spun out of control and there's no real hope for it. But actually, the truth is, the whole of creation, Paul goes on to say here, the whole of creation is waiting. Well, it's, and it's waiting with groanings. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's with an eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God because the creation was subjected to futility or hopeless, what seems like hopelessness, and to its bondage to corruption. In other words, the whole of creation is groaning and longing for the day when it is finally delivered from the weight of sin, and, the, and humans are fully delivered from the weight of sin, all those who believe God, who love God, and they are put in charge and the world is, as, is, is restored to the fullness as it was always intended to be. And, um, and so uh, we know the whole world is groaning, the whole creation is groaning and waiting like, uh, like in childbirth, waiting for this time when uh, finally there will be the full adoption of the believers as sons, the very redemption of our bodies in the, in the great resurrection. And this, of course, is a hope we have. It's an assurance. It's an expectation, or it's a sure expectation that, uh, um, that there will be this day of complete and absolute deliverance for the creation and the sons of God delivered into the glory of that creation and then appointed as co-rulers over the world. And why is all that so important? Because... If we are now, according to verse uh, 12 and 13, if we right now are supposed to be putting to death the deeds of the body and beginning to enter into holiness now, what that means is it's, it's like we're in school and we're learning the lessons that will be uh, required for us to be more successful in governing the whole creation later. So uh, a little bit like if you, you know, if you were uh, uh, Prince William, I guess, when you were in school, you knew one day you're going to be the king. So it's the, there's a different context in which you're doing your lessons from the way every other buddy, everyone else would be in school. So um, we know we, we are going to have this whole world entrusted to us. And it's that much more important and serious that we take our lessons seriously now and begin to enter into the gravity of that and the, excuse me, the hopefulness of that. Um, now, along the way, of course, it's such a massive responsibility that the Spirit comes along and helps us in our weaknesses. And he focuses on one primary thing, which is prayers. And the fact that as we look upon our lives and the thousand decisions we have to make on a daily basis for ourselves, for our families, for those around us, our community, whatever our various responsibilities are in the world, that we need the wisdom, we need help in even what to pray for. Um, what areas are we to work on? Uh, in our lives and to give our best energies to so that we might be better prayer, prepared for the grand stewardship and responsibility of one day governing or joining in the governorship of the whole of creation. Um, 
And uh, and then, of course, Paul reminding us of, of this famous verse here that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to purpose, it's uh, actually the word his isn't there. It means uh, those who are called deliberately or purposefully. That when God called us into the kingdom, uh, that he was already prepared for what we would need in order to restore us, to save us, and one day appoint us as um, in charge of the whole of creation. So he has his purposes and we have entered into them, and it's not as though he's caught off guard by anything. We might feel overwhelmed and surprised by what we face in our life, and we may feel like it's often a, a, a loss or a defeat. But Paul's reminding us that God, uh, that all these things, there is nothing that can come our way. Sickness, uh, death, suffering, persecution, nothing can come and and hit us and jar God's grand purposes that have long been in place. To So all these things that happen to us are just means for God to school us and to teach us about holiness and prepare us uh, through these lessons for the great responsibility uh, that we have to one day join his son in the likeness of his son to be conformed, excuse me, to be conformed to the likeness of his son, to his very image, and to be um, uh, sharing in his great honor uh, as a co-ruler of the world. So uh, there's, of course, many details around that, but that's sort of the gist of the argument, what Paul wants to put in front of us, for us to keep in mind it, the big picture of what our holiness means and why the lessons that we're learning on a daily basis are worth the effort. It's a tremendous amount of effort, discipline, hard work to be uh, to be improved morally and spiritually. Uh, if you think of how hard it is just to keep our bodies in good health and eat a good diet, it's it's easy to fail in that. It takes a lot of work just to be in good health, and we know we're, we're the happier if we stay in good health. Well, it's even more so for our spirit, for the inner man, for the inner part of us, that we de- be developed in holiness and righteousness that we might uh, enter now already into the joy of a better life, but really be prepared for the serious responsibility and the purposes that God has conscripted us into for the future. They are massive responsibilities and uh, purposes, divine purposes. It's not there's it's very serious business and sobering in that sense, and we need to take our lessons seriously now and give our best energies to them. And have the confidence of knowing that however much defeat we might think we're feeling on a daily basis, that it is not the case that God is going to use all these many failures and difficulties in uh, in this life. They will not be able to be compared, says Paul, to the glory that will be revealed in us at the end of all this. So the next question. question that you're going to face is in chapter 9, and it's a very simple question. Uh, Paul lists in verses 4 and 5 a number of things about Israel, the nation of Israel. And of course, we're beginning a whole new section in chapter 9. We'll talk about that next time. But for now, the question I have is why? You know, how, what does, why, why does he list all these things about the nation of Israel um, how might they relate to the um, opening statements he makes in chapter 9? So best wishes, and we'll see you next time.